Antonio Donini, thank you for joining us. You spoke yesterday on civil military interaction, the future of humanitarian action. Can you tell us a little bit about your presentation? My presentation was from a humanitarian perspective. I've spent the last 20, 25 years of my life working on humanitarian issues. So I was interested in looking at how the relationship between the civil uh, agencies and the military is evolving in crisis situations. So um, I talked a little bit about uh, the uh, changing nature of the humanitarian enterprise, which over the past 10 years has increased in size, it's become more institutionalized, it's become more predictable in many ways, also more effective. But uh, at the same time, uh, what we've seen over the past 10 years is an increasing politicization of the humanitarian work in the sense that in contexts like Afghanistan, like Iraq, like Somalia today, increasingly humanitarian action is seen as a part of the foreign policy uh, initiatives of, uh, of governments. And that has uh, positive and negative aspects. And actually, I think I focus more on the negative parts in my presentation. I talked about Haiti, I talked about Pakistan, and I talked about Afghanistan in particular. Specifically with the Afghanistan experience, what, what lessons do you think were learned? Well, I think the, the lessons are that, uh, uh, for me, it's very important to maintain a distinction between activities like humanitarian activities that uh, have a basic ethical uh, value uh, and activities that are political. And what's happened is that uh, there's been an attempt by the countries intervening in Afghanistan to utilize humanitarian action as a part of the strategy to achieve the political or military objectives of the coalition. And this has had uh, um, you know, negative example, ne negative impact on the ability of humanitarian agencies to address urgent need. And I gave one example in particular where uh, there was an operation by uh, ISAF and the uh, uh, Afghan National Army where they came to a series of villages in western Afghanistan to bring assistance to this village. And, uh, you know, and then ISAF or NATO issued a press release saying that in exchange of this assistance, uh, the um, uh, Afghan National Army was asking the elders of the village for information on where the Taliban were hiding. So clearly that was uh, you know, an extreme example of what I felt that was not a good idea because it puts the humanitarian players at risk as being seen as part of a, uh, uh, a political or military enterprise while the way in which humanitarian agencies uh, work is that in order to have access and to be able to address need where, where uh, need uh, is, you know, is assessed to be urgent, you need to be able to speak to everybody and to be seen as far as possible as uh, neutral, impartial and independent. Right, and focusing on their needs. Yeah, rather than, of course, you know, the coalition uh, uh, ob objectives, you know, you can agree or disagree with them, but from a humanitarian perspective, I think it's very, it's very important to focus on the needs of the population and, and to have as much insulation or separation from the humanitarian agenda from the uh, political or military agenda. Right, right. And I guess particularly for the military who are in there, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a big ask. It's, you know, they've got military skills, but we're now asking them to, to have a, a sense of diplomacy and, and well, understanding. Well, that, that's what's happened uh, uh, over the past 10 years, that increasingly the military have been called upon to perform activities which aren't, technically speaking, military. Right. And uh, um, I think that, you know, there are pluses and minuses to this approach. In natural, so-called natural disaster context, when there's an earthquake or floods, and if there's not a conflict in the country, uh, you know, th there is a role for the military and the military and the humanitarian agencies can talk and, and to some extent cooperate. But yeah. when there's a conflict, I think you have to be very careful that uh, uh, what the military do doesn't compromise the work that the humanitarian agencies uh, are trying to do. And that, I think, is what we've seen in, um, in Afghanistan. We've seen it partly in, uh, in Iraq as well. We're seeing it again in, in Somalia where uh, you know, the, the, the context of the global war on terror assumes from the point of view of the countries that are active in this so-called war 
that everybody is uh, participating in the same effort, you know, that we're all in the same boat. But uh, from a humanitarian perspective, I think it's a mistake to say that we're all in the same boat because the boat that the humanitarians are in is one that focuses exclusively on the immediate life-saving and life-protecting needs of the population. And, you know, we're not concerned. As a citizen, of course, I have my own views, but as a humanitarian, we're not concerned on whether this conflict is a justified one or not. Antonio, you've worked in this field for, for many years. What drives you? What, what are you passionate about? Oh, well, uh, I actually uh, fell into this field by mistake because uh, I had started my career uh, in the UN working on evaluation issues, doing studies on how the organization functioned. And for 10, 15 years, uh, I was doing that. And then by chance, I got involved in the, uh, the special office that was created in 1988 to address the, the issues of the crisis in Afghanistan. So uh, I joined this office. I went out to, to the region, to Afghanistan in 89. And since then, uh, it's sort of grown on me that, uh, uh, you know, why one does these things is difficult to explain. Maybe in a sense because uh, for my generation, uh, we, perhaps many of us, believed that we were going to change the world, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. And when that didn't happen, we, in different ways, looked for, for areas of work that would give more immediate meaning to what we do. And uh, the, the, one of the, the pluses of humanitarian action is that you are able often to see the results of your work. Uh, and, I you know, it's a very... Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it can be quite difficult work, but it's also rewarding in the sense that you are able to you know, be in sync with the communities that uh, are suffering from the consequences of crisis and conflict and you know, hopefully be able to do something to alleviate their, their condition. So what, what does the future hold for civil and military interaction? Well, I think that uh, uh, probably with the, the, the kinds of crisis that we're seeing now, uh, and particularly in Asia with climate change and urbanization, uh, I think we're going to see more interaction between the civil and the military uh, players. Uh, what we're also going to see is more interaction with the state in the sense that uh, uh, climate change and urbanization if you intervene in these areas, you're going to inevitably be working in uh, either in cooperation or sometimes in tension with the, the state authorities. And I think one of uh, the lessons of the past 10 years is that the, the sort of interventionist spirit of humanitarian agencies has got pluses, but it's also got minuses. For a long time, uh, there's been a perception, which I think is justified, that humanitarians were state avoiding, you know, working around the state. And uh, in these crises linked to uh, climate change, urbanization, potentially technological disasters, I think it's not going to be possible to do that. So we'll have to work, you know, with the legitimate state authorities uh, that are there. And in a sense, if the, if the government is organizing or coordinating the response, then it's going to be easier to see, to, to define the roles of the civilian and the military agencies. It's in countries in conflict like Afghanistan or potentially like Somalia uh, where it, it, it remains very difficult. But when there's a legitimate state, I think it's okay. You know, we can find ways and there's guidelines that define uh, how, how the, the different sorts of players should operate. Antonio Donini, thank you for your time today. It was great. Thank you very much.